Hi, class. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about operant conditioning and also observational learning to finish our topic of learning. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and show you my video. Okay. Well, this is just a little video showing the story of little Albert. We mentioned little Albert already. He is, a, he is a kid who is in a hospital, basically, who is an orphan at the time. And the, the year is uh, in the 1920s, 1924. And there's a, a professor by the name of Watson, John Watson, who does an experiment using little Albert. And in, by, by today's standards, the experiment would be considered unethical, but remember that it was done a, quite a long time ago before there were the ethical standards that we now observe in psychology. So what they did to little Albert is they sat him down and they put a rat, a little white rat on his lap. And little Albert didn't know anything about rats and he wasn't afraid of them. And he didn't, he just basically didn't have any response to this rat. You know, he might've tried to touch it or whatever, but he wasn't afraid of it. And then they started get, putting the rat on his lap and then banging this big bang right next to his head. And of course that loud sound of this metal clanging against itself was very scary to him. And so then he would start to cry. And they did that about six different times. And then they put the rat on him by itself and the rat then made him cry. So you see the same kind of thing we saw with the Pavlov uh, demonstration where we have something that, that the kid doesn't react to the rat. It starts out as a neutral stimulus, but then later it becomes a conditioned stimulus because it's been associated with this loud sound. Albert becomes afraid of it. So it's a conditioned stimulus resulting in this conditioned response of fear. So uh, uh, let's just move on here if I can. Um, let's take a look at, uh, at what the, the implications or the significance of little Albert is. Albert showed, he was a, the first demonstration that emotional responses could be conditioned, could be influenced by classical conditioning. And so, you know, you might think of the emotional responses in your life that maybe have been influenced by classical conditioning. Maybe there's um, certain smells or sights or things like that that you have an emotional response to because they were associated with particular people. I can tell you an example in my life is that I like the smell of, um, of pipe smoke. And I know that I like the smell of pipe smoke because it was associated with my dad because he smoked a pipe when I was growing up. And I used to sit on his lap and I, and I like that smell and I still have a positive emotional reaction when I smell that. I want you to bear in mind that um, a lot of our emotional reactions could potentially be uh, the result of classical conditioning. But I also want you to bear in mind with the little, little Albert study that there are ethical questions to the study, um, certainly, and, and it goes down in history as one of the studies that uh, certainly was unethical in the way that it was administered, partially because Albert you know, potentially never uh, got over the phobia of rats. Okay, at this point, I want to move on to operant conditioning. And operant conditioning is slightly different from classical conditioning, where classical conditioning was the association of two stimuli, like the rat and the loud sound. Operant conditioning is going to be associating a response, something you do, with a consequence. And there's two types of consequences here. One is reinforcement and one is punishment. And there's a very simple law that goes along that, that uh, summarizes operant conditioning. And that's that if the law of what we call the law of effect, if something good happens, then people tend to repeat it. If you do something and then a good result comes, you tend to repeat that behavior. If you do something and a bad result comes, then you, then you tend to not repeat the behavior. And you can see in this uh, photo that this little girl is being potty trained. 
And going on the potty is resulting in her mom kind of clapping and smiling and saying, good, good girl, big girl, and all of that. And that's a positive response. So that kind of reinforcement is going to tend to make her want to repeat that behavior. So we're going to go a little bit deeper at this point into operant conditioning and look at um, some of the conditions there. First, I want to introduce you to a, a very important figure in operant conditioning, and his name is B.F. Skinner. B.F. Skinner was a guy in the 1960s, a psychologist, who developed a box, basically, and it was a, pretty much a cage for a rat or any other kind of animal. You could put a pigeon in there or any uh, uh, another small animal. And a lot of times that was called the operant chamber or the Skinner box. And, and it was a box that was meant to uh, demonstrate operant conditioning. And basically in the box, there was a lever. And if the animal pressed the lever, then a food pellet would come out. And so you would put the animal in the box and the box, would, the animal would kind of uh, run around and eventually would press the lever. And as soon as it pressed the lever, then the food came out. And what did it do? The law of effect, it's going to press the lever again. And B.F. Skinner went on to do a lot of important work in animal training using operant conditioning. And he was actually curious about how animals in circuses were trained to do all kinds of crazy things like a dog riding a bicycle or something like that. And he demonstrated that a lot of things like that could be trained through operant conditioning through a process that he called shaping. So just like you'd shape a, a piece of Play-Doh, you would shape the behavior of an animal. And he did that by reinforcing them little by little by little until he got the desired behavior. So let's say you were going to try to um, train a dog to, to uh, ride a bicycle, what you would do is first try to get him close to the bicycle, try to get him to sniff the bicycle, and then you give him a treat. And then the next time, maybe you would try to get him to put a paw on the bicycle, and then you give him a treat. And the next time, et cetera, et cetera, you keep upping the ante until he actually gets on the bicycle. It takes a lot of patience, but you can get animals to do all kinds of things. And that's basically how it works in the circus when they have animals doing all kinds of um, funny things, you know, raccoons putting money in a bank and things like that. Okay, so I want to look a little bit more closely at this process of reinforcement or reward for a behavior that makes the animal do the behavior more often. And so when I'm going to talk about humans, you can talk about other animals, reinforcement works throughout the animal kingdom. So reinforcement, I want to remind you, is anything, any any consequence that makes a response more likely to occur. So if I were to do a jumping jack right now and you clapped for me or something like that, then that would maybe make me do jumping jacks more often. So uh, here you can see the seal in the picture is getting a treat. He's getting a treat for doing a trick and that makes him do the trick more. You experience reinforcement a, a lot of times in your life. Uh, in fact, every day when you study for an exam and you get a good grade, that's reinforcing. You're more likely to study later. So those are just some examples. Now I wanna break down some types of reinforcement. There is positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. And let me just first remind you, reinforcement is always going to increase the behavior. Whether it's positive or negative, the behavior is increasing, not never decreasing. So I don't want you to think of positive and negative as good and bad. What positive and negative in this case means is whether you are giving something to increase the behavior or whether you are taking away something to increase the behavior. So positive reinforcement would be something like, um, a kid cleans his room and then you give him some candy or you give him some money or something like that. Once again, you are giving something that will increase his room cleaning in the future. Negative reinforcement is when you take away something, again, to increase the response. And so it, it, you have to really take away, if you're going to increase the response, you have to take away something which is aversive. So for example, let's say I wanted a kid to clean his room and I'm yelling at him, I clean your room, clean your room, clean your room, you better clean your room, you've got to get that room clean and blah, 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 blah. And then he cleans his room and I take away that screaming. And that is negative reinforcement. It's negative because I'm 
taking away something, but he is still more likely to clean his room in the future. So for example, I could also take away his chores. If he cleans his room, he no longer has to do other chores or things like that. Um, the seatbelt tone in your car works this way. It's a, it's a good example of negative reinforcement. If you don't put on your seatbelt, you get the beep, 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 which makes you put on your seatbelt, and that will make you use your seatbelt more. In fact, that has been revolutionary in terms of getting people to use their seatbelts because everyone uses their seatbelts now, and they never did before that tone. Okay. Let's uh, continue to talk about reinforcement. And I wanna talk a little bit about reinforcement schedules. So what we have been talking about so far is what is called continuous reinforcement. So remember the Skinner box or the operant chamber where the animal presses a button and then a pellet, a food pellet comes out. Every time he presses a button, a food pellet comes out. Press a button, food pellet comes out. Press a button, food pellet comes out. That's continuous, meaning it happens every single time. But reinforcement is often not used this way. Reinforcement is often partial reinforcement. Partial reinforcement means that the animal might do something and sometimes get reinforced, but not all the time get reinforced. And you're probably thinking to yourself, well, that probably doesn't work very well, does it? But in fact, it works even better. Now let's think about the animal in the skitter box. You press a, he presses the button and he gets a food pellet. And then he eats his little food and he goes, okay, I'll press the button again. He eats his little food and then he presses the button again, he eats his little food. And so he's doing, you know, he's pressing the button, but he's not doing it terribly rapidly or, or um, uh, immediately. If you decide to give him partial reinforcement, you might put him on a schedule for it where he only gets reinforcement for every five times he presses the lever, right? Now, if you do that, he presses the lever once and he doesn't get his food, he's gonna keep pressing and pressing and pressing and pressing, press, press, get the food. Press, 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 get the food. Press, 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 get the food. And so in fact, it makes him work even harder. And so partial reinforcement, it works great. And in fact, it's very resistant to extinction because when you then stop the reinforcement, he keeps pressing for a long time because he thinks that he's gonna get it. So it, when we use reinforcement, you say if you were gonna reuse reinforcement with a child, for example, to get the child to clean their room, just to work off that example, you it, when they're when they're starting cleaning their room, you would want to do the continuous reinforcement because you got to get them in the habit of cleaning the room. So first time they clean the room, you give them reinforcement. Second time, give them reinforcement. Third time, give them reinforcement. Each time, let's say giving them five dollars or a dollar or something like that. Then we want to start cutting it down. So maybe every other time we give reinforcement. Or maybe every four times or five times we give reinforcement and we can even make that number variable. And what will happen is eventually he will start to clean the room on his own without reinforcement. So we want to eventually taper the uh, animal or person off of reinforcement once the uh, response becomes habitual. So, I mean, partial reinforcement works great. Reinforcement in general works great if you want yourself to do something, if you want your teachers to do something, if you want your boyfriend or girlfriend to do something, if you want your children to do something, or your dog or whatever, reinforcement is great. However, it's generally not used very much. Why? Because it requires noticing good behavior. And a lot of people will think, especially with their children, Oh, well, it's his responsibility to do the dishes. So I'm not going to give him any reinforcement for doing the dishes. You know what I mean? But then if he doesn't do the dishes, he ends up getting punished. So a lot of people will use punishment because they tend not to recognize good behavior. But recognizing good behavior is really important. It's important for our relationships. And it's important to increase that good behavior. So the more that you can recognize and reinforce good behavior in other people, the more they will repeat that good behavior. Remembering the law of effect, if they get good results, they'll tend to repeat that behavior. Unfortunately, we don't do it very much. You can use partial reinforcement, by the way, you don't have to use continuous reinforcement. Okay, from there, I wanna to go to punishment. 
because this is always our default. This is what we use a lot of times in our relationship. It's what we use with dogs, is what we use with children. And so the punishment uh, will be familiar to you. Punishment is when you're trying to make a response less likely to occur. Reinforcement is bringing up the frequency of the response. Punishment is bringing down the frequency of the response. So a good example of punishment is when you, for example, slam your hand in the car door. You basically never do it again. Everybody does it once, but you never do it again. Why? Because you learn from that punishment. So some kinds of punishment can be very effective, especially when it's very strong like that. But just in preview of what I'm gonna talk about, punishment is a lot more problematic and it's a lot more difficult to use than reinforcement. Though, again, it is our default. Okay, there are two types of punishment, just like there are two types of reinforcement. There's positive punishment and there's negative punishment. I want you to remember that punishment is always trying to reduce the frequency of the behavior. Always, whether positive or negative. The difference between positive and negative is whether you're adding something or whether you're taking it away. So similar to addition and subtraction. That's how you should think of those words. So positive punishment will be, for example, Let's say um, a child, uh, you want the child to stop sucking his thumb, okay? And if it, if it would be positive punishment, maybe he gets smacked if he sucks his thumb. So you hit him if he sucks his thumb or you smack his hand. A negative punishment, so he's been given something, he's given a smack. The negative punishment would be taking away something. So that would be if he sucks his thumb, you're going to take away his video games or something like that. So similar to positive and negative reinforcement, positive and negative punishment just means adding something or taking it away. But the important thing is you're trying to reduce the behavior if it's punishment. Okay, I want to talk to you a little bit about the use of punishment, because as I mentioned earlier, it's uh, really tricky to use punishment well. Here's why. Punishment doesn't work on a partial schedule. Remember I said that reinforcement, you can you don't have to really do it all the time. You can reinforce sometimes, but not other times. Once you get the behavior established, not true of punishment. Punishment, you have to use pretty consistently. So if the child, if you want the child to stop sucking his thumb, for example, and you smack him, um, you have to really do that all the time because what the child will do otherwise is if he can suck his thumb and not get smacked, he will just start sucking his thumb in places that he doesn't get smacked. So he'll learn if I go in my room and close the door that I can suck my thumb or I can suck my thumb at school because the teachers aren't smacking me at school for that. And I can suck my thumb at the babysitter. What, he learns that. And so, uh, so it doesn't really work on a partial schedule. It's gotta be applied very consistently. Another thing is that if you want to use punishment, it's really important to accompany it by an alternative behavior because otherwise you're just telling the kid what not to do. You say, don't suck your thumb, but there's a reason he's sucking his thumb. So what else can you give him to do, right? So maybe it's a soothing thing. Maybe you could say, you know, snuggle up to your, your thing instead of uh, your stuffed animal instead of sucking your thumb or something like that. And then you reward that behavior. So you need an alternative behavior there present for the child to do instead of just nothing. Don't suck your thumb, but don't do anything because obviously he's sucking his thumb for a reason. You'll want to use the punishment immediately following the response. This is a mistake a lot of people make with punishment where they say, well, I, you know, I wait till your father gets home and then he's going to really get you. He'll give you a good whooping or something like that. That doesn't really work. You know, I mean, when you come home and the dog is crapped on the floor three hours earlier and you spank him for it, it just doesn't work well. So it needs to be there immediately following the response. And that's similar to reinforcement as well. You'd want to do it right after the response occurs so it can get tightly associated with that response. Okay. Um, I want to talk about some of the problems with punishment because pu punishment does have some sort of side effects. For one thing, punishment doesn't eliminate a behavior. And I've already alluded to this somewhat because rather than eliminating the behavior, punishment tends to suppress the behavior. If the child gets punished, if you smack him for 
sucking his thumb. He will be sure not to get caught for sucking his thumb in the future, but it doesn't mean he won't suck his thumb. He will just get sneaky about sucking his thumb. And so what we see with, with, with punishment is that it tends to result in a kind of a sneaky child. A child who gets punished a lot is a child who sneaks around and, and realizes the strategies for not getting punished. But you're not stopping the behavior. You may think you've stopped the behavior. You may never see him sucking his thumb again. But I assure you, he's probably sucking his thumb. So it may make you feel better, but it doesn't eliminate the behavior. Another side effect of punishment is that it tends to teach fear. It, it by via classical conditioning, the association of the punishment getting smacked with the punisher, which is mom or dad, um, results in an association where you know being smacked makes you fearful or causes pain, and then mom gets associated with that pain or fear. So if you want your child to be uh, fearful of you, and I, some parents do, um, then you would, punishment is the way to go. Punishment also tends to increase aggression in children. Children very easily model punishment. If you hit them with a belt, they will try to hit other children with belts. They will do exactly what you do. If you smack them, they will turn around and smack somebody else. So they will react with the same kinds of behaviors. So the do as I say, not as I do, uh, just that just doesn't work. Okay, so let's do a little review of classical conditioning um, versus operant conditioning, then we'll move on to observational learning. Classical conditioning is the learned association between two stimuli. For example, a loud sound and an explosion may, uh, in a soldier, create fear, right? And so these loud sounds and explosions uh, are going to result in fear, the explosion causing the fear. But the loud sound going along with it can then cause later anxiety to loud sounds because you've associated two things, two stimuli in the environment, the loud sound and the explosion. Operant conditioning is that learned association between a response, something you do, and the consequence, whatever comes after that response. And in that case, we're talking about, again, punishment and reinforcement. Okay, I want to talk about um, operant conditioning, uh, which may be, uh, in a sense, sort of biologically disposed predisposed. People are predisposed to basically have certain kinds of operant conditioning uh, works very well. One uh, scenario of that we call taste aversion. Taste aversion is when you eat something and then you get sick from it. People learn that very, very quickly that they become, a, they get a nauseous feeling about that food later on. And that will tend to happen with novel foods. It, it, it does, we don't get the same kind of uh, uh, association with other kinds of, of senses other than taste, but we definitely get it for taste. And that was probably a holdover from our uh, evolutionary uh, uh, past selection that has made us wary about dangers of food and particularly about being poisoned. So I just wanted to mention that is some operant responses uh, and conditioning responses are predisposed to learn easier than others. Okay, finally, I wanna get into our last topic, which is observational learning. Observational learning is learning by imitation of other people. We have some, we, we've discovered some neurological evidence for how humans learn uh, by observation. And again, this is just watching someone do something and then learning how to do it yourself. Now, I know this is kind of underappreciated, you're like, duh, but most animals do not learn this way. So for example, the kitten does not learn from the adult cat how to do things, you know what I mean? From just watching the adult cat, they tend not to learn through observation. But humans do learn from observation and some of the other primates learn from observation where you can watch 
another person do something and then learn it like that. And we've discovered that in certain parts of the cortex, there are some neurons that, we, that have been called mirror neurons. And they respond when we do something and also when we watch another person do it. And those neurons are probably responsible for observational learning. So if I watch someone doing a dance, these areas of my motor cortex, my frontal lobe, are actually responding. And then when I repeat the dance, when I do it myself, then those neurons are acting the same way. So it seems like we are biologically capable in ways that other animals are not for observational learning. And many, many people uh, credit the success of, of humans in terms of um, proliferation to this kind of learning. Okay, well, I wanna uh, talk to you about a famous experiment by a guy by the name of Albert Bandura. And a lot of times this is called the Bobo doll experiment. He wanted to demonstrate how observational learning occurs in children. What he did is he took two groups of children. One group, observed adults hitting and kicking a bobo doll. Uh, now, a bobo doll is one of those stand-up dolls. It's got sand in the bottom. When you hit it, it, go, it, it tips over, but then it pops back up. So he, he, want, he had children watch these adults just beating down and kicking and being real mean to this bobo doll. And they would hit it with a hammer and stuff like that. And then he had another group of children who observed adults being nice to the Bobo doll and they were like serving the Bobo doll tea and you know acting very nice to the Bobo doll. Then these uh, different groups of children were set free with the Bobo doll themselves. So they're put in the room with the Bobo doll. And as it turns out, the first group did exactly what the adults did. They beat up the Bobo doll using the exact same behavior seen in adults. So for example, if the adult picked up the hammer and beat the Bobo doll, then the children did the exact same thing when put in with the Bobo doll. And same with the children uh, who observed adults being nice to the Bobo doll. So that was really a, a indication that children learn what they see. They learn what they see adults doing. Okay, well, that's all that I have for you today. Um, we, had, uh, we had classical conditioning, we had operant conditioning, and we had observational learning. And those are gonna be our pr three primary areas for this chapter. I hope you enjoyed the lecture and have a great night.